when I was little, well, I'm still little actually, but when I was littler, my ambition was to be a, a radio DJ. And two years ago, I started a, a radio show on Sheffield Live about business and social enterprise. And I fulfilled an ambition that day by um, going in and playing Adam and the Ants on the radio. And I, <laughs> I had to text my brother afterwards and said, I've done it, I've done it, that's it. But actually, it's a real privilege to present the radio show that I present on Sheffield Live FM, which is a fantastic community radio station, because I get to meet so many inspirational, and I use that word um, without, um, without taking it lightly, genuinely inspirational social on, on enterprises. And business leaders of businesses with genuine values. And apart from that, my work, um, I do that as a volunteer, but apart from that, my work involves working with businesses and with lots and lots of social enterprises and um, hope, hopefully helping them to, uh, to achieve impact. Um, and we're here to talk about impact. Karen's told you a little bit about SSEN and the, the message there is read, map, respond, get involved. So make sure you do, please, follow Karen's instructions. Um, but uh, impact, outcomes-based commissioning. There's lots of jargon here, isn't there? And what does it mean and how will it affect you? So we've got a panel of people who are going to help us unpick that. And I'm going to introduce them to you in just a, a moment. Before I do that, I just want to give a quick shout out and thanks to the sponsors of the event today. We have Arcon Creative Technology, and Rachel Nunn is here. Rachel, please stand up. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Viewpoint Research, a tele research social enterprise, are here and sponsored the event too. Alistair Ponton's here. Thank you, Alistair. And the Wasco Brown Foundation, and Joe Boardman is here. Thank you, Joe. So we're talking about measuring social impact. Why? More and more contracts and funding parts are using an outcomes-based approach. What does it mean? There is, as I say, a lot of jargon. And I have a few questions for you, first of all. Is this year going to be the year that more and more people start to understand what the Social Value Act is? Because I go to loads of events and say to people, hands up who's heard of the Social Value Act, and no one put their hands up. And, um, and I'm not going to make you do that, because I don't want you to, to, to embarrass yourselves. But will it gain traction? It was introduced in January 2013. It requires people who commission public services to think about how they can secure wider social, economic, and environmental benefits. You all know that. But not many of us would dispute the good intentions of the Act, but many people have criticised it for failing to enforce consequences if not followed. And also maybe not enough commissioners are even aware of it. Last year there was something called the Social Value Summit. It was hosted by Social Enterprise UK. And Lord Victor Adebowale, who's a crossbench peer, but he's also the chief executive of Turning Point, um, said it was one of the fastest acts to ever pass through Parliament. He said, if an act passes through Parliament really quickly, it's often because all the teeth have been extracted. Maybe. Before the act was introduced, the Social Outcomes Fund was set up in November 2012 to provide a top-up contribution to outcomes-based commissions. Um, now, if we're mainstreaming outcomes-based commissioning, some commissions are still probably risk-averse. That might resonate with some of us. Um, it was interesting, though, to see in the Chancellor's awesome statement in um, 2015, 105 million pounds has been talked about to stimulate new social impact bonds. So social impact bonds, what are they? Well, there have been 20 or more in the UK so far, and uh, they've used a couple of different approaches. We're going to find out about those in a moment or two. Um, but next month, the Cabinet Office are going to announce social value awards. They've been launched to recognize and celebrate good practice in terms of public service commissioners. So there are a few things going on. But as I say, what does it all mean? And talking on the phone before today's event with all of the speakers, Sue and I were saying the other day about jargon, jargon, outcomes-based commissioning, social impact. We're going to try and unpick some of that. So I want to welcome all of our speakers today. First of all, we have Jason Flynn. Jason Flynn is a funding manager at the Big Lottery Fund. 
working within investment to plan and to deliver and manage funding programs and projects to help achieve outcomes, impact. So Jason's responsible for managing uh, resources and budgets, and he's part of a team of funding managers, um, specifically in the social investment teams, Jason. And um, you work on the Social Incubator Fund program and, of course, the Commissioning Better Outcomes program. So, Jason, I just want to ask you a quick question. Um, something very unusual about yourself. I've, I've, I've bared all when it comes to Adam and the ants. <laughs> Once when I was a very small child, me and my twin brother were inadvertently photographed and appeared on a postcard uh, for Redcar, which is where I'm from. Um, that photograph was then plagiarised by The Sun a few weeks later and appeared on the front page. Good so point. I have actually been on the front page of The Sun. <laughs> oh, wow. <well. laughs> Congratulations on that. that. <laughs> and, um, a couple of examples of social enterprises that uh, you've, you've, uh, you've bought from or commissioned from or you know, a couple of social enterprises have crossed your path in the last uh, few weeks. Right. Um, well, one of my favourite ones in Newcastle is the Newcastle Art Centre, which is a great social enterprise up there. It has a, um, does a range of different things. Uh, but the, the primary thing that I normally support is the, the shop there, which is obviously for for young artists and things like that. So you can get some quite unusual pieces and there, which I normally buy for Christmas and things like that. Uh, my mother-in-law is also a artist, so I normally go there and buy the art materials and all that for her as well. Um, my other favorite social enterprise in Newcastle is, is a cat cafe called Mog on the Tyne. Mog on the Tyne, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> which is, which is uh, obviously very popular within the office and that as well. So people obviously, some, you, have, you, have to, you can't even walk in, you've got to book actually. Uh, so you can go and obviously have something to eat and, and stroke the pets, so. Super, okay, Jason, hello and thank you and a warm welcome to you. <laughs> so moving on, we have, uh, we have Sue Osborne, director of the Yorkshire and Humber School for Social Entrepreneurs one of a network of schools for social entrepreneurs across the UK and overseas. And each school supports individuals to start and to scale up social enterprises. Sue's um, remit includes leading, growing the school, and you've worked as a freelance consultant before that for several years, um, supporting fair trade and social enterprises. And you've been business De development director at, at Shared Interest, leading an international team. And um, um, helping it to uh, uh, move from UK to a presence in, in internationally. So, Sue, tell me then something international, uh, something unusual about yourself. So, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, five years ago, I managed to realise an ambition of mine when I wrote a book. And the book was called Investing in a Fairer World, and it documented the history of shared interest. And before you think this is a sales pitch for the book, it's available for 1p on Amazon, so I am not going to make any money out of this. Um, but I had the opportunity to write it, and I absolutely loved being able to get into that research piece and do all of that work. And I actually wrote it when I was pregnant uh, with my second child. And I learned something, actually. I always thought I was quite organised and got things done. Uh, but I was in the early stages of labour when I finally decided it really was time to hit send to the publisher. So it was definitely a last-minute job. Super, thank you very much, Sue. And a couple of examples of social enterprises that you've crossed your path. Uh, lately? Well, I'm in the very privileged position that uh, by heading up the School for Social Entrepreneurs, I'm working alongside social entrepreneurs almost every day of my working life. So um, that question is quite a challenge for me because there are so many cases that I could cite to you. Um, but what I'm going to do is just choose uh, two that I've been involved with this week. So the Yorkshire, um, current Yorkshire cohort of startup social entrepreneurs had a programme day in Leeds on Monday. And we invited one of our social entrepreneurs in the Northeast that went through the programme the previous year to come and talk about emotional resilience. Now, Ray Farmer runs something called Next Steps, Learning for Life. And she does some fantastic work 
getting alongside often young people or people with mental health issues, really supporting them with those very critical uh, core skills about building confidence and developing their emotional resilience. Um, she, she ran a brilliant session for our students. Many of them were um, amazed at her own personal journey that she's been on with her mental health issues. So she's a social entrepreneur that's definitely worth watching. Whenever we have any of our speakers that come along, we try to give them a small gift. And so the gift that we gave Ray this week was from Harry Spectres, which is a social enterprise that's actually based in Cambridge. Um, it is the most fantastic chocolate company. So look them up, harryschocks.co.uk. Um, it's the inspiration of a very young man who is autistic. And he had always dreamed of being a part of a chocolate factory, making beautiful award-winning chocolates. And with the help of his mum, he has managed to realise this dream. And this um, exquisite chocolate company has grown and developed. And now the chocolates they are selling uh, across the UK and internationally. And almost all of the employees are people on the autistic spectrum. So do look them up, please. Harryschocks.co.uk. Super. Thank you, Sue. And a warm welcome to Sue. Mark Tuckett, Head of Policy and Improvement at Sheffield City Council. Now, Mark, you've got some really interesting things up your sleeve in terms of significant things, far-reaching in, in ambition, groundbreaking in comparison to other places. Now, we like to think of Sheffield as groundbreaking. And uh, a few years ago, I had to chair an event about, is Sheffield the greenest city? And not on that day, I came back from Manchester and a whole load of kids from Sheffield on the train with me, and I said to them, is Sheffield a green city? And they said, no, everyone goes on about parks, but we should get rid of plastic bags. This was in 2003. So I stood up at the event and said, well, I was on the, on the, on the, on the train today with a bunch of kids, and they said we should get rid of plastic bags, not go on about trees, if we, you know, if we, if we want to say we're the greenest city. And uh, someone stood up in the audience and said, Jamie, I think that's the lo biggest load of middle-class claptrap you've ever come out with. So, um, <laughs> uh, and I've come out with a lot, probably. Um, but, um, but, but uh, Mark, so um, we, we, we talked about far-reaching ambition. So I would like to hear a little bit more about this. And I'd love to hear also something unusual about yourself. Um, so 15 years ago, I rescued a friend of mine who was in a sinking in a crocodile-infested river in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, he was sinking because he was in a rubber dinghy and the rubber dinghy had punctured. And it wasn't just a crocodile infested ri river, there was a crocodile just two meters away from, from where he was at that moment. The rubber dinghy was probably designed to be on Durban Beach rather than <laughs> on having just gone through some rapids on the Zambian Angolan border. Precisely how we came to be there is a much longer story and I can <laughs> talk about that later in the, in the break afterwards and other uh, African animal-based uh, escapades that we got up to. Super, <laughs> wonderful. Any social enterprises that uh, cross your path lately? You will have guessed that Jamie primed us with, with some of these questions in advance. I really struggled with this, actually. I think the work that Colette's talked about, about mapping the social enterprise space in Sheffield, would be I would have found very helpful to, to know about before, before being asked this question. And I'm going to risk alienating part of the audience <laughs> here by coming up with a couple of examples, one of which I don't think is, is a, a social enterprise, but certainly has been in the past, and a couple of other areas, uh, other instances which I think could be, perhaps should be, but, but probably aren't. One that I know is a social enterprise is Fusion Capital. Cafe. So anybody who is um, from Sheffield will know about uh, Fusion Cafe, which is run by the Freeman College. It's down at the Academy of Makers, and it provides educational and vocational support to young people with learning disabilities. And selfishly speaking, they do a very, very good cup of coffee. So I often have uh, meetings down there. It's also somewhere where you can have a meeting and you don't have loads of other people listening in either. So, so I, the Fusion Cafe is, is definitely in the category. The, the half is the Riverside Pub. Now, I think the Riverside Pub used to be a community pub. Um, I sadly think it no longer, no longer is. But certainly when it was, I had a very enjoyable Christmas party there, which I can remember bits of. My team remind me of various instances of on occasional, on occasional circumstances. <laughs> Super. Mark, thank you and welcome to Mark. <laughs> and Jed Devlin likes trains. <laughs> um, you made it though, which is yes, fantastic. Yes, thanks Jamie. So, uh, no, no I, I, I know the journey and I, it can be very frustrating sometimes. But uh, It was Doncaster Sheffield that messed me up in case anyone's wondering, so <laughs> everything else fine. 
Super. Well, Jed's programs manager at uh, Power to Change. He's worked with uh, community businesses, and um, he also has worked at the Community Shares Unit, of course, for yes. for, for, for many uh, for several years, where you helped sixty thousand new investors come to the market in less than five years, generating <coughs> long-term growth finance sought after by community businesses. And of course, there have been several community share issues here in Sheffield too. Um, Power to Change, an independent charitable trust mm -hmm. set up to support, develop and grow community businesses across England using £150 million from Big Lottery Fund. So, Jed, um, something unusual. Uh, I think I'll follow Mark's lead in terms of not giving much context, but my, uh, my mum and dad were married in Strangeways Prison in Manchester. Uh, there's a story behind it, but it's how, you didn't ask for context, Jamie, you just asked for facts. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, that was that, that was that was brief. <laughs> and tell us about a couple of social enterprises that have passed your way, passo, that have crossed your path. Lately. Yeah, well, so I live in Salford, um, and um, the main one that comes up all the time is Salford Community Leisure, which is one of the uh, spin-outs from the government way back when, which is a not-for-profit uh, mutual that's community-owned. Um, so I'll go swimming there quite a lot, but if the thought of me in swimming gear is probably about the most unappetising thing anyone's heard this evening, one of the other ones that follows on is there's a pub in Salford called The Star Inn, which is community owned, and I was privileged enough to work with it. It was the first urban community pub in, uh, in the country, and it's, a, very, it's a, a lovely one that sort of really illustrates the whole thing that I think about community business, and the reason I think that it's great is it's really that whole idea of um, tying in the, the stakeholders into the business structure by making them owners and involved means that I walk past several pubs in, you know, all right, they're, they're shutting down at the rate of knots 52 a week or whatever in the country. But I go past pubs that are owned by corporate structures to go and drink in one that resonates with me because it's community owned and, a, and it's sort of really, it's, a, uh, it's certainly about the furthest away you could imagine from a twee community business as it goes. It's pretty rum. Um, but it it's also does two other things that are great with this type of business model. The beer's cheap and it's good because that's what it has to be for its consumers who are its owners. Fantastic. Well, good beer is good business. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> super. So welcome, Jed, and uh, welcome to Jed. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm well aware that many of us here in the audience will have specific questions about outcomes-based commissioning, about commissioners' frameworks, and also about funding that's available to social enterprises. And there's going to be plenty of opportunity to ask the panellists some questions, but I, uh, I'm going to start with uh, with a couple of questions that I already have for for panelists in terms of uh, um, key areas. I'm going to start just first of all, Jason, if I if I may. Um, can you just tell me? Can you just say in, in simple terms what what's an outcomes based approach? Let's just define it. Let's just be clear. It's about creating impact, isn't it? It is. It is um, at the big lottery fund because we're actually dealing with public funds, um, we are, and not probably always will be, an outcomes funder. So um, everything that we fund has got to show or measure some type of social impact. Okay, great. And one of the pots, one of the funds, is the, is the Commissioning Better Outcomes Programme, in effect. So this programme, how does it work? Well, um, this program we set up in um, July 2013, and as has already been mentioned, uh, the SOFT program was launched by the Cabinet Office, uh, which was the uh, Social Outcomes Fund. That was a £20 million pot. Um, the Commission Better Outcomes Fund was a £40 million pot, and they were co-designed. So separate in, in what they wanted to achieve, but there was one application process, one set of application forms, and everything like that, and representatives from the Cabinet Office and Big Lottery Fund made all the decisions on them. And this was primarily for um, or commissioners to um, deal with payment by results models or social impact bonds, where they could drive more more and new services to those most in need uh, that were financed via investors. If, uh, in, in very basic layman's terms, the interventions worked, the um, commissioner would save money. Part of that 
saving would be paid back to the investor as, as a return, but these would be social investors. So we're talking here about payment by results. We're talking about uh, specific returns required by the investors and, inve and commission saving money as well. Now, in terms of the programmes, and the social impact bonds that you, uh, you mentioned, social impact bonds as well. There have been about 20 social impact bonds. Have you been watching the, the progress in the, in, in the UK? Yeah, act actually, the most up to date figures now, there's about 32. 32. Fantastic. There's about 32, yes. Um, that and we're hoping by the time um, we've made our full awards out of the CBO programme, uh, which hopefully will be by summer next year, uh, we'll have double that so we're looking at probably finance 33 full awards ourselves right tremendous and most social impact bonds use an approach that's called the rate card approach to um, specify outcomes um, but some use the impact measurement approach and this is where sometimes it gets confusing because the rate card approach is still about providing impact and demonstrating impact, isn't it? It is. It's about uh, obviously showing improvements against a baseline. Um, and um, obviously other approaches uh, could be more, what you could say, traditional approaches where you could uh, use things uh, uh, like outcome star and that type of thing to, to measure probably the softer outcomes and that, that type of thing. So measurements of outcomes and measurement and demonstration of impact is absolutely crucial and people people social enterprises who need who want to bid for this kind of work or secure support in this kind of program need to be able to demonstrate impact definitely definitely uh, my advice to anybody looking for any type of funding is obviously to to have a good basis for why you want that funding um, especially in the this day and age where funding is finite uh, make a good case for it it's not just a nice to have it's it's a definite need uh, back that up with data um, not just national data but local data as well if, if it's going to be a local based um, project okay so data um, in terms of backing things up but uh, there are lots there's lots of different ways to measure impact and I want to I want to unpick what might be best for some of the people in the room because some of us will have heard of things like so social return on investment. Has anyone heard of that? It's, uh, yeah, and it's, it's, it's complicated and it's definitely not something that meets the needs of a lot of social en enterprises. Now, you've probably looked at different ways to demonstrate impact yourself. Definitely. I mean, what I um, would advise anybody that's not sure how to uh, measure any impact, uh, there is a fantastic website uh, which is inspiringimpact.org. Okay, so we'll, has... we'll, we'll, move, we'll move on to that. We'll, we'll move further on that in, in just a moment. Thank you, Jason. Um, so there's an incentive then for local social enterprises to be able to demonstrate impact, uh, whether that's they want to support from big lottery, they want uh, support from programmes like commissioning better, better outcomes, they want a bid to, to, to commissioners. Um, so we were talking on the phone as well about uh, about impact demonstration, and we're talking about jargon. Now, now's the time to talk about jargon, isn't it? Yes, I, uh, I made the comment to Jamie that my dad very much told me that uh, you should always use smaller words rather than longer words because many more people will understand them. But um, for me, so we do a lot of work across Yorkshire and the North East with startup social entrepreneurs, and if you're not careful talking about measuring social impact, just become something that people are anxious about, scared about, put off doing. And actually, if you break it down and look at really what we're talking about, it's just proving what a difference you're making. It's as simple as that. And I firmly believe that you can capture a lot of information in a really simple, straightforward way that can actually prove the difference that you're making. Um, Brilliant. So, well, let's go into some of that, because I think that's going to directly uh, assist some of the people uh, in the rooms and social enterprises here. And, um, and, and you're working with the social audit, right? Yourself. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so um, I'm trained by the Social Audit Network um, and I'm trained as a social auditor. I've also got a background in working in social accounts with my previous employer, Shared Interest, for, for 10 years. And we started that process at Shared Interest very simply and looked at, um, first of all, our mission. What were we about? What were we trying to do? And really trying to be clear in our mission. And having identified our mission, we then specified what activities we undertook to deliver that. And once you've identified, and this applies to anybody in the room that's running a social enterprise, once you've identified your activities, it's then about looking at what are the outputs and the outcomes from those activities, and what indicators have you got to show what difference you're making. Now, this can be really simple. You know, for some of our startup social entrepreneurs, when they join the School for Social Entrepreneurs, uh, they're on their own. By the end of the programme, they might be employing two people, they've got 10 volunteers, and they've hit the lives of 1,500 people. But for us at the School for Social Entrepreneurs, we're also interested on the personal journey that that social entrepreneur has had with us. How have they built their confidence? What skills have they developed? And looking at indicators that allow us to see that journey travelled. But I, I really would urge anybody that's looking at this to not see this as something that is um, an add-on or an, addi an additional activity or something that they just have no idea how to approach. You will be doing a lot of impact measurement in your day-to-day -day work as social entrepreneurs. And actually, it's just about formulating some of that and, and capturing some of that data, but also some anecdotal stories to present a rounded case that shows your social impact. Okay, super. Thank you, Sue. So let's just move across then briefly to, to, to Mark. Um, because, Mark, we, we talked about, uh, um, when we introduced you, we talked about uh, something groundbreaking in, in, in Sheffield um, and far-reaching in ambition. And I'd like you to just introduce the idea here, if, if you could. Sure, thank you. Um, I've, I... I Firstly, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk today. I'm, I'm Head of Policy at Sheffield City Council, and we've been doing some work for some time under the broad, broad badge of public service reform, thinking about what do public services look like over the next five to ten years' time. As part of that work, we've looked at the total amount of public money being spent in Sheffield, and we, um, we commissioned some uh, an, a, another organisation to, to do that work for us. They reached a figure of £4.1 billion. Pounds, so there is still £4.1 billion pounds of public money being spent in Sheffield. That's, that's purely revenue expenditure. A further between um, 200, a quarter of a billion and half a billion pounds of capital expenditure. And we had a strong sense that we could probably do a bit better for the... Uh, we could probably achieve better outcomes for the, the £4.1 billion pounds of public money that's being spent in the city. That's spent by central government, local government, and local government includes Sheffield City Council, it includes local health providers, South Yorkshire Police, South Yorkshire, South Yorkshire Fire and Rescue, and so on. So a range of different agencies involved. Um, what is emerging is a, a picture of, of what, Shef uh, what public services could look like in, in five to 10 years' time. And we're thinking about, in the health space, how can we invest in primary and community-based health services so that fewer people end up having to go to hospital. Providers are incentivized to keep people healthy and well um, and, and incentivized financially as well, rather than the current system where we've got some providers are actually incentivized if more people go to hospital, if more people have operations. We have this perversity in the system which isn't suiting the needs of, of Sheffield's population or the providers within, within that, um, that economy either. In the employment space, can we move towards a single provision, it may not be a single provider, but a single access point for employment advice for everybody who's out of work but is, is able to work and also for people who are in work. So people who might be in work want to increase their skills, people who might want to understand more about what other career, career opportunities are there out there. Can we bring together some of the, the, the diversity of employment support that's out there? Um, if we talk about public sector assets, there's some quite um, surprising anecdotes in here. In Sheffield alone, there are over a 1,000 operational land and property assets in the city. 
So um, over a thousand assets with, as you might imagine, a pretty significant book value um, and also a, an almost just as significant backlog maintenance costs as well. And it seems to us that there is almost certainly a simpler way of organizing that public sector asset base and probably a cheaper, more cost-effective way of organizing that public sector asset base as well. Um, simpler for people to use and, and cheaper for the estate to, for, for the state to, to afford. And I think one of the other aspects we're thinking about is community capacity. What are the investments in the genuinely preventative power of stronger local communities, that social capacity, physical capacity, um, and that we, 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 we know should be there that should encourage more people to, to look after each other and look after themselves. We have not got all the answers to any of the, the, the uh, instances that I've, I've talked about just now, although there's, there's a lot of work thinking about those things at the moment. When I've sp spoken to people about this, people have engaged with the, the concept, but they've said, how could we ever possibly finance the changes from current position to future position? Public budgets are stretched. Public budgets are only going to get more stretched. How might we move from current position to future position? And that's the innovative, groundbreaking thing which I wanted to talk about today which is a public service reform investment fund. No other city has got something like this, and I'm having a lot of conversations with central government and investors at the moment about it. Um, and I'll just quickly talk about what, what I'm proposing. It would involve raising a significant amount of money, um, a, an investment fund, if you like, and that money would come from a variety of different sources from public money, um, public sources, both central government and local government, from social investors, so those are those investors who might take a slightly less commercial rate of return but still expecting some return and are motivated by social aims as well as commercial aims, and private investors too, so uh, we're having conversations with pension funds and so on. Um, we, haven't we haven't said exactly how big this fund might be, but I want to give you a sense of scale. Um, if we were to just invest 1% or maybe 2% of the total amount of funds under that investment fund's influence, remember that figure of £4.1 billion, we'd be talking about a £40 million or an £80 million investment fund. And that's the sort of scale at which we're, we're thinking about here. So trying to raise money from a variety of sources to get to that £40 million, somewhere between £50 and £100 million. So there's quite a lot of work in order to do, to do that. That's step one. Um, step, step one. And what, what, what is the ideal time, time table here? Um, I'm ambitious. Um, I would like to maybe have something like this up in place in 12 months' time. OK, super. Now, great. And this has um, the potential to, to be directly applicable to many people in the room, of yep. course. And um, um, it also is a model that then potentially other local authorities would, would adopt and, yep. and, uh, and copy too. Now, we'll come back to that in a moment, um, but uh, we'll just move on to, to Jed if we, if we can. Jed, power to change. Um, and, of course, um, you have, as, as we talked about, worked at the Community Shares uh, yep. Unit. I just wanted to ask you, because from the point of view of a funder, um, social enterprises seeking investment, mm -hmm. seeking support from programs, and um, seeking to win contracts. Um, they have expectations, but funders have expectations as well. Yeah, course. absolutely. And um, funders' expectations aren't always well understood by social enterprises. Perhaps you can go through some of the common expectations that funders have and need. Yeah, of course. Um, so there's an interesting thing there, as Jamie's mentioned, that I'm, uh, I'm totally green to grant funding in terms of coming from an investment background and primarily over the past six years, a social investment background. So I came into this like I come into most new jobs, being a bit cocky and a bit like 150 million quid as an endowment, brilliant, it's going to be transformative. And then I looked at the initial grants program and got a bit terrified, actually, because we had an open run on, our, on the money. So we had a six million pound program, you know, saying, right, just apply for us. It's a pilot program. We're going to test out what we're doing. And basically in three months, we were asked for an endowment. And I'm just hearing the figures Mark's talking about there in terms of, you know, 4.1 billion revenue expenditure, quarter of a billion capital expenditure. And it sort of puts into context that money and how far you'd get with that money. And like I, every conference I go to, you're speaking at 10 organisations, maybe 12 organisations, and their capex, their capital expenditure, what they're asking you for could be like 10 million quid. So you're looking at it and go, right, well, we do 15 things in a month and that's the endowment gone. And so I'm not so cocky about it anymore. I'm a little bit 
little bit terrified about it. My job mainly, though, in terms of what the... I mean, so we've got a few things in that market. My job primarily exists is we've been established as a leverage funder, so it's endowment money. So my, my job is to work how I make that money go far enough. So how I work with organisations to say to them, you want 500k off us, it's probably not going to happen because at the end of the day, we were asked... We had 800 applicants for for 20 something grants you know that's the sort of, so what's that like sub three percent is getting funded presently so me try to get that message out there that this is ultra competitive but actually maybe we need to think about what we're doing with funding it's mixed in with the fact that because we're set up with all these sort of values about being a catalyst for change and we want to be as transparent and open as we can you can find out what our funding requirements are on the website and they're in fairly distilled you know there's they're sort of across four key cutting themes which are we want to be putting money into organisations that are sustainable or on the way to being sustainable. We want organisations that are creating high social impact. Um, and, you know, we, we do articulate what we mean by impact. We put 5% of our total endowment into a research institute that's going to try and look at some of this work out there and help articulate it for the end user. Because if the end user's not using it and not articulating it well enough, then I think that's the major problem. And we're also looking at, you know, we want to see community control evidence. So where's the community mandate and where's the community accountability and transparency, which is something I believe is missing from quite a few parts of the sector, if I'm being totally honest. And, um, yeah, and it's that whole thing about the money's got to be sustainable. It's 10-year money. When we're gone, we're gone. And if we haven't sort of been a catalyst for some for, sort, of, sort of change, then what was it all about, you know? So is community accountability missing? Uh, that's that's a, an interesting point. Have we been a cat catalyst for change or are we going to be catalysts yeah. for change? Um, and in terms of expectations as well, and that was very helpful, I think, um, funders... Um, and certainly social investors rely a lot on financial data. Yeah. Um, but talk about wanting social impact. Yeah. And social impact bonds notwithstanding, um, as we've talked about, it can be difficult to measure. Does that increase the cost of due diligence? Does that increase the cost of, um, of being a funder. Yeah, I think so. It, it definitely increases the cost of the so, in the social investment space because if people aren't pricing impact, right, they're not, then they're pricing cash and they're pricing risk. And if they're not able to understand that if it's finance first and impact second, or if it's uh, sort of speaking a language of the, the sort of use of mainstream finance, then you're making distinctions between them being the end user and us being the people who are pricing this stuff. And I think that's, it's not very useful. It's not useful to the market. It's not useful to us. And it's not useful in terms of the pervasive way that all these organizations that you're dealing with and the organizations providing the cash into the sector, if they're investors, if they're grant funders, you know, if they're retail investors and the ordinary investors, you know, what are they buying? Well, they're buying narrative. That's the whole thing that I've worked on and the whole retail investment space that I come from in the, you know, in the sort of the community shares world, which is asking people, ordinary everyday folk, to invest in community infrastructure and assets. You know, are these people the type of people that Mark was talking about who'll accept sub, you know, zero or sub-zero returns on their money? Yeah, because they're buying into the social impact that you're selling them. So it's how, how do we switch on the institutional investors to think like that. And then you, there are some brilliant exemplars, you know, everyone in this room will know Key Fund and Clayton and Karen, everyone from there, who are very good at this and sort of know this and they've got the key fit device and there's lots of others out there who, who really understand and buy into this narrative of what it is you're purchasing with your money. But we've got, definitely there's room for improvement for all of us about how we go about it. Okay, super. Thanks, Jed. So I think that was very helpful and I think it's really about time that you had the opportunity to ask some of our panel some questions that you might have about... Uh, about outcomes, commissioning, about impact. And um, I'm going to open it up to you. So I'd like you to put your hand up if you want to ask a question. And I think uh, John will come around with a roving mic, say who you are um, and uh, what your question is, and the panel will address it. If you don't have a question, I have several. But, uh, but anyone's got a burning question, put your hand up, please. Okay, I'm going to warm, warm, warm uh, okay. Uh, so, we're trying to measure social impact, but what tools can you get to measure social impact? You know what I'm uh, as I was talking about earlier on, uh, there's a fantastic website out there, uh, inspiringimpact.org, uh, and that has, I think, 30-odd different types of mechanism to 
measure social impact, like outcome stars, that type of thing, uh, tailored towards certain types of projects. Uh, it's one of the best websites I've seen as, as far as that's concerned. Um, when you're measuring social impact, though, it doesn't need to be, uh, you don't, it's, it's always good to use something that's tried and tested, but at the, at the same time, there's nothing wrong with collecting your own data and using your own type of spreadsheet <coughs> and everything like that as well. Um, the main mistake that I think some organisations have when they're trying to measure the social impact is that they don't measure it when they first start. Okay, so please make sure that when you actually do have any cohorts or anything like that, that you take a base measurement first so you do have something to compare it against. Well, again, of course, you don't know what's changed and what's attributable to you if you don't know where you started from. Okay, super. And um, Sue, you made some points on this already. Mark, um, do you want to... Actually, you're going yeah. to come back on that question. Um, there's a tool, if you're quantitatively minded and sort of enjoy working in... Microsoft Excel. Yeah. Um, uh, New Economy Manchester have produced a uh, cost-benefit analysis spreadsheet. It's probably geared towards public service professionals rather than others, but I'm sure it would be helpful. And it, New Economy Manchester. So if you search for the New Economy Manchester CBA tool, CBA stands for cost-benefit analysis. What they've done is they've pulled together a range of different outcomes and they've put costs sort of... Uh, academically identified <coughs> costs associated with those those different outcomes would be worth a look. New Economy? New Economy Manchester. New Economy Manchester, thank you, Sue. Please may I just add on to that, that uh, for any smaller organisations that are in the room, if you look at either of those websites and you feel rather scared, <laughs> then uh, do come and talk to us at the School for Social Entrepreneurs because there are some simpler models around. And I think, you know, I think it's absolutely vital uh, you know you've heard from the funders you understand what the funders are saying in terms of what they want um, but I do think it's important that you also are able to very much look at your organization I mean we used uh, measuring our social impact to drive the strategic direction of our organization um, and that was important for us at shared interest so uh, yes take your baseline <coughs> create your own method of doing it do look at some of these tools but uh, just making a case for simple is fine too for the smaller organisations. Okay, great. Um, has anyone seen a, an example of a really good impact report that, uh, that, that really brings it to light in terms of human interest and data? Because if you haven't, then there are many on the Social Value International website. And whilst that organisation pushes a, a couple of specific frameworks, they do have DIY social impact reports it, um, available on their website if you dig deep into the resources. Now, probably um, your students have created their own impact Yeah, resources. although there's one um, organisation, a housing association called Gen2 in the North East that I did a little, little bit of work with, and I was incredibly impressed with their ability to get uh, the nice balance between quantitative data and qualitative data, and they captured some fantastic case studies that really brought their social accounts alive, but they'd done their homework, they really knew their data, they'd really got their figures. I'm assuming that Gen2 is spelled G-E-N rather than Gen. G-E-N-T-O-O. And you, certainly on their website, you can get a summary of the document, and if you were minded to, you could write to them and they will send you a set out. Fantastic, great. Now, Jed, did you want to add anything in terms of impact measurement? Um, it's, again, I suppose, I, I work, uh, I'm on the board of trustees for a charity called uh, the Active Communities Network, and it turns over three, four million quid, something like that, and they did this, I shouldn't be admitting this in a full room, but I'm, I'm halfway there now. They did a social return on investment analysis, and I'm one of the trustees and should have read it, but it was really, you know, it's huge, and I dipped into it and sort of read it, and actually, but there's a good, interesting point there, because it wasn't for me. I, as a trustee, I should know a lot of this stuff anyway. You know, I should know why it exists and what it's doing. It was for their basic model is to is procuring contracts. So when they're going to organizations, the SROI being a methodology that people use, they'll put it in there. Now, 
the SROI, I, I like it, and I've sort of, you know, I've looked at bits of it and I've had it explained to me. Um, it's way too, old, you know, the scale and scope of it in terms of, say, some of the retail investment stuff we're doing where we're looking at organisations raising 100K and having a turnover of 200K. You know, it's, it's, it's not appropriate, I wouldn't say, in terms of the scale. It's way too in-depth. And there's a really interesting approach that I like a lot of the social investment intermediaries that they take, which is... You know, having a baseline, but asking the organizations they're working with, why don't you measure what's important to you? And then, you know, there's a room for negotiation there because, like, ultimately, we're buying into your narrative. And I think that's a very... It's a nice place that the social investors, rather than the grant funds, are in sometimes because, you know, your, your main remit as an investor is to make sure they, take, they draw down on your money and you're buying into what they're... What they're you know, what you're investing into what they're, what they're telling you, whereas the grant funding can sometimes come with too many contingencies. You know, we want you to... And it sort of, you know, tail wagging the dog bit. And I don't think that's necessarily the case with investment sometimes. OK, great. Thank you. So who here is entirely confident that they can measure their impact and demonstrate it in a fantastic way. Not many people want to say, yeah, I'm brilliant at measuring impact. So, so probably some of it, all of us can do with, with, with measuring and demonstrating impact more clearly, more effectively. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to open it up again um, because I'm sure whilst, whilst uh, our panel are here, um, more of you have a couple of queries. So please don't be shy if anyone wants to... Uh, question, um, Jason. Sue, Mark and Jed, please do. Um. I, could, I could probably try and shout. Um, it's really, uh, I'm a charity, so obviously social impact we've had to do for a long time, but I think something that concerns me is the opposite way around. Of a lot of <coughs> what so social finance is about scares us because of the financial terminology mm -hmm. rather than the kind of social terminology. And even then, a couple of times you were speaking and I'm going, I'm not, I don't know what you're talking about. So is there something to do with funders and even our local council being a bit more understanding about dumbing it down a bit when it comes to speaking about finances? I know your background gets finances, so... Yeah, no, it's, uh, well, I, I mean, am I, uh, is that, it's directed at me, am I the jargon person here? I feel like, if I, if I am the most sophisticated jargon person in the room, we've got massive issues. Uh, yeah, I, I do think there, there's a really dangerous way that the social sector has evolved over the past three or four years, which is all this finance speak first, and, and it is vulgar, and none of it's very nice. And actually, it's this, a colleague of mine was referring to the year zero of social investment a while back, that as if all these charities that have existed for 25, 30, 40 years, you know, what they were measuring up until social investment became the thing, meant that everything they'd measured in the past was, you know, immaterial. Now, of course, that's stupid and, there's like, and it's redundant and, like, really, you know, it's appalling thinking. Uh, I, in terms of your specific question about maybe understanding the jargon and, and maybe how the sector presents itself. I, I remember having a bit of a stand-up row with a guy a while back because he was berating a, an organisation, a social sector organisation that didn't understand what a bit there was, and I've not even said it right because some people say that da. But it's like it's basically it's a it's a quantum, it's a it's a uh, an algorithm for measuring a company's worth, yeah. And he was sort of saying, oh, they didn't understand what it was. Now my point to him was this. If I was wealthy enough to have an independent financial advisor, I'm not and I don't, but if I was um, and I went to them and they were advising me on a financial product that I was looking at buying and I said, well, what does IRR mean? And they sort of tissed and chided me for being perhaps a bit too immature to take on their product. Well, guess what? They're not getting a sale. Yeah? And there's the thing about the, the product in the market has to fit first and foremost the end user and that's what our role is at power to change so if it's that if that is part of the issue is that access to finance is a big barrier for community businesses and part of that access to finance is the barrier is terminology and skepticism and all the other things then we've got a bit of a job to do but it's totally solvable that one that's the easiest one you know is to you know actually make make the, the, the sector more comfortable with this stuff is and Big Lottery and everyone else are doing great, you know, making great strides with that. And I think they're absolutely on the front foot of the Big Lottery SI team. Uh, you know, I've got a lot, a lot of time for it. So there's an issue there in terms of language um, and accessibility. Yeah. Um, and access to finance is something that uh, responsible finance, the organisation that's the umbrella for, um, for, for organisations like Key Fund, 
they, they say there is a big gap still in terms of social enterprises and community-led organisations and the availability of finance, um, notwithstanding fantastic programmes being available, but there is more demand than, than, there, is, uh, than, than there is finance. Jason, you're going to come in. Sorry, uh, for any <coughs> charities, VCSEs, uh, not sure whether uh, social investment is right for them or even indeed what it is really. Um, there is a program that Big Lottery are involved in that is delivered on, be uh, on our behalf with the social investment business called Big Potential. Um, there is some fantastic uh, stuff on the website there. There's a diagnostic tool on there to s that you can complete to see if your organisation is ready. Uh, there is a simple two-minute guide to social investment on there that explains everything in like layman's terms as well. Um, there is two strands <coughs> to the big potential. Uh, the first is breakthrough, and I'm just going to read this verbatim, so, I, so forgive me because it's not something that I, uh, I don't look after this. Uh, but breakthrough is targeted towards organisations who want to raise up to £500,000 in investment. Eligible VCSE organisations will be able to access specialist one-to-one -one support from the big potential programme partners before making an application for a grant to undertake more in-depth investment readiness work with one of big potential's approved providers. Okay, so that is something you could obviously look at as well. Um, the next uh, stage of that is the advanced, and that's targeted towards organisations who want to raise up to £500,000 in investment or bid for contracts up to uh, over a million pounds. Uh, the advanced route uh, is available to VCSEs that are clear about uh, the, how social investment work will work for them. So you've done the breakthrough work, you've, you've, you've done that, you know exactly where you're going to go with it. And you can describe a potential deal or interest from investors. The advanced route is available to organisations that need help securing a contract as well. And grants for that are available between 50 and 150,000 pounds. Uh, the smaller one, uh, the grants can go from 20 to 75. Great, okay. Thanks, Jason. And again, so that demonstrates that there are a range of different programs, different support available there, dependent on where you are um, in terms of needing investment readiness support, um, grant support, what size you are. Um, so you can get in touch, you can look at those different programs on the site. Yeah, there's also, sorry to uh, hog the mic, uh, there is one that we're involved with as well called the Growth Fund, with yep. ac the Access Growth Fund. Um, that uh, just launched last year, and that is uh, providing finance to SIFIs, social investment f uh, financial intermediaries. Um, and we're looking to make our first award on that shortly and VCSEs will be able to apply to that um, later next later on this year as well. Later on this year. Yeah. Super. Okay. Thank you. What's what's VCSE? Voluntary yeah. Community Sector Organization. Yeah. Brilliant. Sue, did you want to come in on that uh, on, on that one? Um, I, I just wanted to add actually that um, <clears throat> so our experience at the School for Social Entrepreneurs, we do a lot of work with startups but also scale ups. And uh, the national network of uh, schools has been doing a lot of work with uh, social finance organisations and the government to just really highlight, and you can kind of hear it from some of the figures that we're talking about here, there is a real gap between those really small startup grants. And then when you're talking social investment, there's a lot of noughts involved. And so the School for Social Entrepreneurs has been saying, actually, this is we've got to bridge this gap. We have to allow some of these social enterprises to dip their toes into the water. And so we're doing some work, and it's work in progress. There's nothing that I can announce. But um, hopefully, over the next year or two, there will be much smaller pots of social investment that will allow people to just get a feel for it. And, and I think that works for both. You know, it works for the social enterprises, but it helps to just close this gap with the funders so that the language is understood and people are comfortable with the investment that they're taking on. And hopefully, that will then allow people to grow and develop and go for some of these bigger pots. And it's probably worth mentioning Unlimited as well at this yes. point as well, yes. um, because, because of their support and how they work with individuals as well. So, yeah. um, great, super. So that, that's helpful, and the work that you're doing there at, uh, at SSE is very helpful. 
and um, looking at the School for Social Entrepreneurs website will, 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 um, will, will be useful. Mark, do you want to come in on that, or should we turn to our next question? Uh, yeah, super. So, Alice, you had a question. That, uh, uh, yeah, just do, you want, do you want to take the mic? Thanks. Yeah, um, it's, it's probably just for Mark, actually, around uh, commissioning. I was just wondering whether you had a sense of how the um, Social Value Act had been implemented in Sheffield in terms of, I think particularly in terms of consistency, do, do all services teams implement it in the same way, or do they have quite a degree of freedom around how they, uh, how they implement it? It's not an area that I'm close to, I'm afraid. I, I so <laughs> um, I will, my off the record uh, response is probably that I think people are aware of it. Um, I suspect it is interpreted reasonably broadly and people have a reasonable degree of freedom about how they interpret it. But I think that demonstrates, and it goes back to some of the things we said right at the start of today, some of the, some of the, problems that many people perceive with the Act and, and its implementation as, as, as well. Um, and, and this is probably an issue with commissioners across the... It's a fairly non-restrictive... The, the clauses in it are fairly non-restrictive, so the duty to consider social value is, can be easily demonstrated without actually necessarily changing one's commissioning behaviour. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure others of you have quick questions, so, so let's turn to the next, next question. We've got uh, a couple of minutes left for questions, so we've probably got, ma we can manage two or three more. So, yeah, uh, we'll get the mic, Debbie. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, my name's Debbie Matthews and um, I'm ch uh, I work for an organisation called Manor and Castle Development Trust which is the social enterprise or a charity depending on who I'm talking to because uh, I think <laughs> definitions are quite interesting. Uh, so my, my questions for a comment really is around outcomes and um, my, my experience around trying to deliver outcomes and, and working within a commissioning stroke contract framework uh, and um, one of my, I suppose my question is around how you interpret outcomes and the length of time it takes to actually achieve outcomes compared to outputs. Um, because my experience is that people say that they're, uh, they're commissioning for outcomes, but the reality is they need the results quicker than we can actually achieve outcomes because working with some very disadvantaged, vulnerable people means it's not a linear process and it takes a lot longer um, and how that fits with the funding streams that you've been talking about. I think that's a, that's a, a great point. Perhaps you, we, you can all give a, a, an observation or comments on that. Um, start at this end, that, uh, if, we, if we can, Jeff. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, well, um, it's an interesting one for us, I suppose, in terms of how quickly our money goes in and some of the constraints we'd put in on the initial grants programme with how quickly the money goes in and how quickly you want to see results which is probably in some ways a bit peculiar because we're talking about sustainability and what, the, what our exit looks like at 10 years. I think they had to put some of them constraints in for the grant funding because of the nat you know, in, ter in terms of a pilot, what we were trying to do with that is to have at least some idea of what we'd be putting our money into for the next nine years. So it's kind of got to be stuff happening now. So, you know, capital money needs to be going and be spent and we can see what the bricks and mortar was, revenue money goes in, you get what it was you were, you know, contracting for and we can see it and evaluate it. I think moving forward, we're going to have to move towards a bit of a position where there is some, what I'd probably in a very inarticulate way call fizz money, where you're sort of taking a punt on what, what some of the impact is, and it'll be smaller amounts and able to go in there and hopefully go quite far. I think there, there is a whole thing about, you know, Manor and Castle is a good example. You know, if I was to ask you to give me a brief overview of its history as a development trust, I'm sure it'd be quite difficult to do. And I think a lot of the community asset-based organisations that I've worked with in the past, you know, maybe six years. Um, let's see, Hastings Peer Charity is opening this spring and I've been working with it fairly intensively since 2009, doing a very small part of it. And what, what impact will they deliver? Well, that impact isn't going to be able to be measured from 2009 to asset opening. It will be in 2025 and beyond when it does the stuff that it said it's going to deliver on. So, it's, yeah, it's a good question. It's probably, bizarrely, it's probably not one that we can answer very easily, seeing as we're 10-year money and we're, when we're gone, we've hoped to have affected the change and have the market telling us what change we've affected. 
So, tenure money, that's a great position to be in. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> I think it's a really good question. How, how do you define an outcome? And in particular, how do you measure an outcome? And I think often the way you decide or you propose to measure the outcome determines how that particular program ends up getting managed. So if your outcome is making people healthier, but you're measuring that by having fewer people going into hospital, then you, the, you'll end up having a contract or arrangements which is counting the number of people going into hospital, which may or may not indicate whether or not people are achieving the overall outcome of being healthier. And it's, it's part of the, the, there is this inextricable link between the outcome and the measurement arrangements. And I think it's as much about how we decide to measure outcomes as it is deciding what the outcome is in the first place. I think you're right as well. There's some of these contracts are set up as slightly harder to achieve outputs sometimes than sort of ne necessarily purely defined outcomes. I think when the this, this social impact bond space gets quite interesting in that you can start to think about sustainment of some of those outputs or even outcomes over a slightly longer period, but there's still a time dimension to it as well. And I, when I talked earlier on, some of the perverse situations we've got where you've got time-limited job outcomes in Department for Work and Pensions, DWP, and you've got, you can, Troubled Families Programme, if people are close to that, sort of the, ne the new wave of Troubled Families, outcomes have to be sustained for a family for a year. That's difficult, but a year is still not all that long, and actually there's still there's plenty of time after that year for, for things to deteriorate and get worse. So it's, a, it's not an easy, not a quick answer, and I probably don't fully answer the question, but some, uh, lots of different aspects to it. It's, it's not an easy, uh, easy question to answer, but, uh, but, but uh, thank you, Mark. And, and Sue? I think you're obviously not alone in being in that catch-22, and I know, you know there's many growing organisations that will be desperate for that kind of contract, and then just really struggling in terms of how they can achieve those outcomes. So, Jason. Just on top of what everyone's said previously, um, I suppose as a, uh, a grant funder with, grant, with a grant head on, um, when we fund outcomes, we also uh, put indicators in every year and we would expect them to be measured each year, which are obviously the easier targets for you to hit. Uh, but at the end of the project, then we would ask you to obviously to <coughs> explain your yearly indicators, but also then demonstrate how you've achieved and measured the full outcomes that you've set out in your full application. Okay, super. Thank you, Jason. And of course, this is this is something that, uh, as has been mentioned, will be familiar with for, for many people in the room. And if your um, your social purpose is to work in very difficult circumstances or with people who've um, um, got significant disadvantage, um, then it's going to be for the long term as well, your, your, your work as well. Now, we talked data as well. Um, <coughs> Alistair, um, data, viewpoint, um, that's what you do, um, part of what you do, data as, w as, as well. Um, I'm going to throw this back at you. You, you, you asked the question, now, now on for you. Um, any, any, any tips? Any, um, what, are people are, what are people struggling most with and how do you help them? Um, I think, I think there's, the, the, what we've come across is there's, a, um, there's sort of two ways of doing it. People go very quantitative and try and um, capture data in numbers which prove very difficult or they go down the route of proving impact through some case studies, through stories, which again are, which can be possibly more powerful and have a bigger impact to the person reading to them, but possibly don't, um, don't necessarily get what the, the funder or the commissioner actually wants. So it's, or I think people, I think from where we come from, people who approach us don't know what they, don't know what they're trying to prove to them. Indeed. So there's, it, they know they, people, people know they need to prove something. But. I mean, they, they need to prove something, they're not sure how, and, then, and neither of those two methods seems to, to do it properly. You know, they're able to do it, which is what they think should be done. So um, certainly that's the, you know, that's the biggest problem we can find yeah. in terms of how people get it. Like okay. Well, we've got time for about one more question, I think. So I'm going to, uh, going to give people, James. The microphone's just coming across. Oh, 
Uh, I wondered if uh, you could give me an example of the, the best bit of qualitative social impact you've heard. So there's something that's been really effective in a funding bid or that, that's qualitative in nature. Thank you. That's a, it is a big one to end on, isn't it? <laughs> it's a tough one. Personally, um, I always think the, the best measures of social impact are ones that actually use qualitative, but also it's backed up with quantitative and case studies and that as well. Something that takes uh, an approach, a bit of, a bit of everything. Um, but I think one of the most simplest and effective ones, if this is what you're getting at, uh, me measures that I've seen for a lot of Grants pro basic grants programs that we've got through reaching communities and and um, and that is just the, the basic outcome star method. Okay, we, again, it's on that website I mentioned earlier on, insp uh, inspiringimpact.org, uh, and it's very basic, but um, but very good. Uh, even children and 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 that can complete these things. Super. Okay, Jason. Thank you, Sue. Any any good examples that, that sort of crossed your path? I think the reason I quoted the Gen Two one earlier is because it it really did hit the mark. So you you go through it, the the data that's in there. They've used a system developed by uh, an organisation called Hacked, who, if you like, are a kind of housing association version of SROI. Um, so they've got their figures that are very specific for the housing association, and you kind of accept that. But it's the case study. And they were talking, I remember one that stood out for me was talking about one of their tenants who just hadn't been able to leave the house and then through the support of the Housing Association had made really small steps in terms of building confidence and being able to actually engage with the society that was outside his door. And for me, you, you can look at that data, you know, you've moved 10 people towards employment or whatever, but that case study, then you just think, wow, I really get that now. Gosh, look at that difference that's been made. So... Uh, that's why I think I put that one up, really. I used to work for a charity called CAMFED, and they provide educational programs for young women in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I wrote an impact report for CAMFED when I was there, um, and one of the qualitative um, uh, impact examples that we gave was a young woman who had benefited from the charity's program. She'd been supported to go through school. She benefited from the post post-school um, enterprise support, actually, to enable her to set up her own enterprise. And the ultimate outcome for... Well, she, she was a, a very successful young businesswoman in Tanzania, but she ended up meeting Michelle Obama at the World Economic Forum. And we had a photo... So what it, 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 I think there's something about that distance travelled. Where somebody come from, where have they got to? It was supported with photographic evidence as well. So you could see where Mercy was her name, lived in her village in Tanzania, but also in this forum with Michelle Obama listening to her on the other side of the table. It was really powerful. Um, I think I've got another... I have a perspective on impact as well, and that's, that for me is a very external aspect of impact. My, my one cautionary tale would be don't lose sight of the internal interpretation of impact as well. You can tell everybody how great you are, but make sure you it's either a true story or if there's something else that you need to be keeping an eye on in terms of are you as a social enterprise genuinely having the impact that the, you think you are, you don't publish that and you don't tell people about it, but there's an internal interpretation of impact as well that it's important not to lose sight of. Thank you. Um, Case study wise, and the sort of qualitative one is, is FC United of Manchester is, is the one that I always would, which for those who don't know, you know, what's a club if it's not um, about keeping value within its community, if it's about extracting value from, from the community and, you know, making brands and stuff, that's a bit weird. Uh, whereas if it's about retaining value in the community and making sure that it's buying from the community, then great. And they regularly get about 10% of their members. So they've got about 4,000 members, um, regularly get 10% of them volunteering. Uh, I was speaking to one guy, because I've worked with them for quite a while, who had a sort of, you know, middling job, a mid-income job, I don't know, he was like a sort of computers or finance or something like that. They did a door knocking thing when they moved to their new, their new location in, uh, in East Manchester. They went out and they sort of did, you know, sort of isolated people. They were going out and knocking on and saying, you know, if you need anything. And this guy, something twigged inside him that actually this was quite a rewarding job and he was actually quite good at it. So he went and he jacked his job in and, turned, and he went into palliative care. And that stuff, I was just like, God, that's amazing, you know, and you wouldn't have got that without having that sort of affinity about what a 
a community controlled organization is and what your role within that organization is and how that can impact you personally. I think that's, that kind of stuff's amazing. The one thing, I was having a look at some stuff before I came actually, researching some stuff, and you know, I've been a big advocate of the, it really isn't up my street, I wouldn't have thought, but you know the spirit level? You know this whole idea of you know, GDP and measuring and all that type of thing? Because uh, the GDP factor came out a while back, which I, was just, I just loved because it conjured up this image of a career civil servant in a tank top in Swansea, um, sort of sat behind his computer, measuring the street value of SCAG, of heroin, uh, and the wholesale retail value, which is now included in GDP. You know, it's included because of sort of illegal activity. And that was his job, you know, and I, was just thinking, I just thought, well, that's, you know, the, never mind extracted impact, but actually, you know, what, what does it add to the economy? And you're just sort of looking at it going, that's probably the strangest thing I've ever heard. But uh, it does, yeah, it makes a nice incongruous image, at least, in my head. Super, Jed, thank you. That's, uh, that's, a that's a great one to end on. Good impact reports that I've seen is the organisation Responsible Finance. They're members of people like Key Fund, um, <coughs> who lend to businesses and social enterprises and individuals who um, have been turned down for bank finance. Um, they did a report called Inside Community Finance. Um, Lots of human stories, but also lots and lots of data about the number of people who had, for example, been at risk of or borrowing from people like Wonga or illegal, very high interest lenders on a personal basis who have been, in effect, saved from, from those, those lenders by their members. And also the number of businesses, entirely creditworthy and social enterprises, that couldn't get the finance that they need and lots of stats on that. You talked about a statistically and data-driven report as well. Now, I really would love to take more questions, but it is 7.30. You've been fantastically interested in our panel, and our panel has uh, been very generous in their knowledge, and I know that there are trains to catch for, for lots of people in the room. So if you do have a question, try and catch the panel informally now, but I want to bring our formal uh, proceedings to a close by, first of all, thanking uh, Sheffield Social Enterprise Network for, for organising this and for all the work that's been done by, by all the, the, the voluntary board to make it happen. Um, thanking, of course, the sponsors for, 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 for being involved tonight and supporting it, um, without whom I don't think it could have happened either. Thanking you all for coming and, of course, thanking Jason, Sue, Mark and Jed for, for their contributions. So thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>